have a quick chat before we open to audience questions um, to go a little bit deeper in some of the things that we touched on in those talks. I'd firstly just like to start with going back to the beginning. When you had the idea for these businesses and what you wanted to do, what are some of the practical steps you took to take that idea into reality? Maybe a few just like things, little bits of tips of inspiration of things that you did that really helped you actually take the idea into reality. Trini, you had the idea for your products. You wanted to make them personalizable, customizable. How did you make that idea into reality? I think the first thing I did when I kind of, I, I knew I had to have a business plan because I knew what the idea was, but I thought from the idea to executing. Mm. So I downloaded Stanford's or Harvard Business School business plan for three pages. Like never say anything if you can't say it in three pages. So that was kind of really good actually because I think sometimes the smaller idea is the longer we take to describe what it is because we're still formulating in our head what that idea is. We're still trying to refine it. So just to, you know, for me to say portable personalized makeup, you know, premium portable personalized makeup, it started off as a, uh, as a you know, 20 word sentence mm. um but so i think that's really good because it does you will come across people at, er, in every day who you need to get help from and you need to know what's that one sentence to describe what i'm doing mm. and um i think once you've got that then you feel that confidence in your business and mm. then it allows you to go and pitch and talk and and get more advice and information mm. so simplifying that message i yeah. suppose yeah. max so do you have a business plan ish um, Expand. I, I feel like I feel like business plans are definitely useful for a lot of people. I think the issue with them is that a lot of people spend all of their energy and efforts doing that rather than doing something and talking to people. And so for me, the two most important things are getting out and talking to people. I've always been absolutely blown away by how generous people are when you're an entrepreneur because people kind of want to back you they want to support you and so they're willing to give their time energy and thoughts and experience because you're you're, you're going it alone and giving it a shot and that that was i think a, a big help and linked to that was always just go and do it because i think I, I went to business school did some thinking about it did some presentations a lot of people told me my business was rubbish and if I just continued refining and refining a business plan and more people telling me how bad my business was, I probably never would have launched my business. Yeah. My business was quite bad when it launched, but now it's all right because we learnt by doing. And so I think just doing it and learning by mistakes is the only way you can actually make progress. Mm, there's definitely a sweet spot of taking advice, but not too much that it yeah. kind of puts you off or takes you away from what your idea is in the first place. Abba, did you have anything to share on getting that into a reality? I think um, you have to write a business plan and I don't think you have to stick to it. I think what it does is it helps you to, it really forces you to be very specific. So as Trini alluded, you know, what, what's your elevator pitch in, you know, two sentences, what is your business about? Who are your target customers? Being really specific, who are your target retailers? Putting it down uh, in writing really helps you to think hard about what are the nuts and bolts of your business going to be? What are the fundamentals? How are you going to get your product to market? How are you going to get your product in the hands of those particular retailers, those particular customers? Unless you write it down and have a plan at the start, you know, it's very easy to be all over the place. Mm -hmm. And I think it just helps you to focus. But equally, once you've got the plan, the second you have your first retailer meeting, it all goes out of the window because, of course, they're not all going to materialize at the rate at which you want them to materialize. And, you know, all the customers aren't going to appear as quickly as you want them to. But um, I still think it's a very worthwhile exercise. Yeah. But once you've got the plan, put it aside and just go for it. Yeah. Jack, how much uh, planning was involved with your business? Um, for us, it, there, there was a lot of testing um, because what we were doing at the time is something that's new. Uh, we have two customers, we have the practitioners and then we have the customers. Um, so, you know, interviewing a lot of uh, practitioners, understanding their mm. pain points, the qualitative component of, of that research was, was fundamental to mm. our product building. Um, and then on the customer side, you know, you know, customers don't know what they want until they see it. You know, particularly in, in our space, it was a, it's a new concept. So, you know, we did a lot of um, uh, fake door testing, which is basically going onto Google, um, basically understanding what they will search for online and then run some ad paid ad spends and see how many people click on it. Mm -hmm. If people click on it, um, you know, it fundamentally that there was a show of intent. So, but we did develop a business plan when we raised our seed money, we raised the pre-seed um, 
and that forced us to be focused, um, prioritizing what we will invest the money on and what we need to achieve in, in order to unlock the next stage of growth and so on and so forth. Mm. Shrew, talk to me about planning. <laughs> I have to be quite reactive, but I know that um, when it came to planning, I had to trust that people were reading these self-help books and were approaching well-being um, the way that I was. So I sort of appealed to the, the laziest, um, <laughs> the people who were going to skim. Mm. <laughs> so I would always read them in that I would open a book and look through the chapters and think which one is actually relevant to me and then just skip the rest. <laughs> so I, I decided to write for and create a program for my, myself at my most resistant and laziest. Mm. And that was uh, kind of what I, the, the road I went down, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Um, and Trini, you touched on the talk very quickly about investment. Um, I'd love to just hear a little bit more about that. So um, about the financial side of your business and perhaps some of the challenges you face and the advice for people looking to raise money. Well, I think that, you know, I did an SEIS scheme, which is an entrepreneur's scheme, but an SEIS is when you raise up to £150,000 and then anyone who does an investment in your business, if that business were to fail, they get 50% of their tax back. Um, so it can add up to even more, actually. So it's a, it's a kind of, if you're doing that first round and it's friends and family and you're asking people to have faith in you and you're asking people close to you, then you know, there is, there's always a risk in, in taking money from friends and family because it can be the worst cause of, of problems. So, you know, the two people I took for were not my closest family members and they were not, one of them was a good friend, but, but knew my work ethic and I knew that I would let him down. The next round was oddly harder because, it wasn't harder, but it was suddenly I was with the big boys, so I, I really had to have the right business plan. And I think the most important things I learned from that is don't oversell your sales because um, a lot of people just do this kind of, oh, after three years or after five years. So we did quite a conservative plan and then we doubled what we thought we'd do. So for the next round, which I completed in December, we had you know, we could say we did that and we did a bit more and we did mm -hmm. that and we did a bit more because what becomes harder if you're growing and you want to grow really quickly and you want to go and seek investment and not be self-funded and there's, there's definitely arguments for both. But I know that I'm not 30, I'm 55. I have a short time in which I really want to grow this business, so I need as much momentum as I can have behind me. If I was 30 starting this, you know, I look at, there's a wonderful woman, um, Chrissy Rucker, who started mm. The White Company. She owns that 100% with her husband. She spent 30 years of her life building that business, and she's in an amazing position, employing lots of people with a wonderful work ethic, and she gave me a Young Entrepreneurs of the, uh, of the Year Award last year. And I learned a lot from her. I had a day uh, in their boardroom with them, you know, as a part of this prize. And it was just really interesting hearing her perspective and knowing that that was not an opportunity I would have. And I didn't have assets myself, you know, to put in the business because I was in that stage where I kind of had nothing. Um, but I then, when I got my first main, so I, I went to see all these people and it took forever and ever, and then Unilever Ventures came in. And then I, the other people who I'd pitched it to then, because they felt that was a more serious investor, I thought they'd turn immediately. But it sort of took like a month, and then suddenly they did. But, but there was this one investment, which was the most important investment to me. And we can't, because I want Unilever to be the most important investment. But <laughs> this girlfriend of mine I'd gone to school with, um, and she um, lives with somebody who's got money, but she doesn't have much of her own money. And she um, said, you know, I went to see him to invest. And, and he said no. Um, and then um, it was too early or whatever it was. You know. So she then called me up a few days later. She said, Trini, I've saved 50,000 pounds and I want to give it to you. And I felt really like, do I take it? This is my oldest friend. We, I started my first entrepreneurial business called Bose Unlimited with this woman. You know, it was such a, and then I thought, and this is kind of a little bit weird. I have to have faith in myself. Mm. I have to know that already I've done okay and I, I can take it, you know, and she's doubled her money, <laughs> which is really nice. Um, but, you know, so that it's very difficult who you decide if you need funding from outside, who you take it from, the relationships you have with those people. You don't want to never talk to your brother again or, you know, so it has to be carefully thought through. Yeah. Um, but there's a lot of help, you know, doing the 
uh, EMI schemes mm -hmm. are really good because they're a, a very much more secure way for people to, to give you money uh, for themselves. Yeah. Fantastic. Does anyone else have any advice to share on raising investment or any kind of financial side of things? I think, I think always knowing, getting expectations right, I think is pretty important with the investors you're talking to. So I think like there's, a, there's, always a, there's always a tendency, I think actually from the investment side for the investors to kind of promise the earth and say they're going to you know, add huge value. And I think you, you want to scrutinize that. Like as a, as a company that's looking for investment, you're the one who's used to being scrutinized. And it's so often people lapse into that, that, that situation of sort of saying, well, you'll do because you're going to give me money, quite mm. frankly. And actually, you, you, it is worth really, really thinking about the value that comes with that. And there are lots of investors who add no value whatsoever, mm. and that's fine, but as long as they and you are completely clear on that. If you get some guys who work in finance who don't know anything about your business but want to give you a couple hundred grand, great. Take it if, you're, if that's what you're expecting. What you want to be wary of is people who, as I say, promise you the earth and tell you they're going to add huge value to their business, and they're not, and they don't have a track record to do it, and they don't have any reason they would. Um, and so I think scrutinizing that mm. is definitely important and something that not not that many people do necessarily. Because, yeah, being cautious, cautious of that relationship, I mm. suppose. Um, moving on quickly just to brand. Um, you guys all have amazing brands and really strong brands and also with personal brand as well. I'd like to ask a little bit about brand identity and voice. Um, what are some of the things that you did to understand your brand better um, and any advice you can share for building a strong brand identity? Anyone at all, feel free. I can talk about it. I think you have to look at every single element of it. So when you consider a brand, well, you've got to ask yourself, what is it that you're trying to achieve with it? What is What does your brand do? Samaya's tagline is achieving perfect balance. And Sama means balance, Alec means uh, abode. So it's really about communicating that sense of tranquility that you get when you use our products, that sense of, of course, it's taking care of you know, the functional aspects and delivering moisture, hydration, whatever. But it's really about um, allowing you to find your own perfect balance. And with that, I spent a lot of time thinking about what the logo would, well, naming the business, of course, is important. The logo, what it looks like, the touch points in terms of um, you know, the packaging, the colors that you use. For us, you know, each of the colors that we use reflect that particular <coughs> constitution type and what balances each constitution. The aromas that you use are really important, the ingredients you use. I mean, it's, it, it's every step of the way, every decision you make, where you choose to retail, how you choose to retail. I've said no to more retail, way more retailers than I've said yes to, but it's, and uh, we're a very small business, but I think it's really important to think about controlling that. And this goes back to, I mean, a little bit to the previous point. So I chose to go down a slightly different route. I, uh, didn't take any external investment, but I've retained all that control. So mm -hmm. I think, uh, especially in the early days, it, it, it's another um, model, basically. But for me, it was really important because Ayurvedic skincare is a relatively new concept in the West that I maintained that control and um, really wanted to sort of um, think hard about each and every aspect of the brand, whether it's the product or you know how we get it to market, where we sell it, and the colors, the aromas, every bit of it. Mm. Shu, do you have any advice to share on brand identity? Yeah, I think um, I'm a big fan of Brene Brown's. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with her. And I'd say if there was one word, takeaway word, when you think of her, it's vulnerability, and vulnerability being power and strength. And I've noticed more and more um, I initially thought I had to be aspirational because of the weight loss story and everything. And I had to, people had to want to be like me. And I didn't want that. And it wasn't really resonating with people. <laughs> Sorry, I just realized maybe that's insulting to me. But it wasn't really <laughs> resonating with people to like be like me. But then I realized, what if my brand was just, I'm doing, I'm trying what everyone else is trying. I'm just, I've just geeked out on a few more books. And I'm a few steps ahead. So come along with me and learn as I go. and. I look like you and I speak like you and I'm not perfect. And it's really, um, people really like that, mm. I think. And the authenticity of that has, the more I'm myself and the more I demonstrate my weakness and show what I have the capacity to do despite it, um, the more people kind of get on board with my brand of kindness towards ourselves. And I think also kindness, I was very lucky, my agent 
my literary agent um, came up with the word, the kindness method, actually, and I have a lot to thank her for, because I was very lucky. Um, uh, the book came out the summer that um, England did very well nearly in the World Cup, and, oh God, I'm gonna forget his name, the captain of the England team. Gareth Southgate. Gareth Southgate, thank you. They were doing all these articles about him and kindness, and how kindness was so cool now. And so they were like looking for the kindness lady, and it was me. <laughs> so they were like articles in Grazia, how Sharu and Gareth for Southgate brought back kindness this summer. And I was like, brilliant. <laughs> so that actually worked out really well for me. Um, but I think self-kindness um, was something that a lot of people weren't doing as much. And looking at self-kindness, not in, in a gentle way, but in a grittier way, in that self-kindness was about um, doing things you'll be happy you did tomorrow, not relieved you did in five or 10 minutes. So that's mm. become my brand. It's a beautiful message. Um, just quickly, I want to touch on building a brand through social. So when you talked about using IGTV, um, do you have any more advice to share on how you can build up your brand on social media? And I think it's also what you say. And I, I, I when I started, um, I knew that I kind of was me. And, and I, I, what was really interesting, I'd been in a partnership for so many years that that I always felt Susanna was the funnier one and the more emotive one. And we both discussed, we were together a couple of nights ago, discussed how, in a way, by being this sort of yin and yang, we slightly each suppressed mm. elements of our whole character. And for Susanna, it was that she actually could be organized, whereas she let me do organization <laughs> or whatever. You know, she's, yeah. she, it came from her saying that. And I just thought, I think what social media has allowed me to do is to be myself and for people to either resonate with that or not. So I will, you know, I will, I will try anything. And I do try anything. Yesterday I was doing a live with a wonderful woman called Julia Hunter, who's Dermatologist America. And I, I let her blow up my eyeball to uh, such a gruesomeness that people were saying, I have to switch off now. It's so disgusting. <laughs> but I thought, I'm going to try it because I want to see what it's like. Wait, hold I, on. Can we just, why was she blowing up your Because eyeball? she was uh, injecting CO2 under my skin and I was trying it out. Okay. Why not? So, um, you do you. So, and I kind of, I feel it's really important to be very on, you know, I was, I've had Botox since I was 35 because my forehead moved like this when I was starting to do telly. So I felt it's really important to I'm very very honest on my social for anyone who follows me and I felt that it's really interesting when you're building a brand is and I'm a person and I've been slightly in the public eye what brand values of me are in that company Trini London mm. and that I think is the biggest challenge because the brand is me I live and breathe it you know everyone who comes to work in it I just was talking to a group of ladies who are working for us in Phoenix and I was saying you know you need to smarten up, yeah. You know, it's like giving them, this is, you know, an extension. The hardest thing when you're a mainly online brand, this is the hardest thing, is when you're in retail, you can no longer totally control that experience. Like online, I control the whole experience. Mm -hmm. There's a team building the site. I know what the audience is like. I know on the social media. But then once you're in retail or somebody else is representing your brand, that's the scariest thing for me, mm -hmm. you know, and, and just how you, you know, run that one, you know from retail and, and you, you know from franchises, it's just, it's still your brand, you know, it has to be that it's your brand, it's not somebody screwing it up. So you're scrutinizing your franchisees, you know, and just with you, a therapist, it's a the wrong therapist, it screws up your brand, mm -hmm. you know. So that's a really important thing to consider is who are the people around you representing your brand to give it that integrity. Yeah, and how can you, yeah, how can you get them to represent the best possible version yeah. of your business? Yeah. I totally understand that. Jack, do you have anything to share on branding? Um, yeah, sure. Um, we, we always like start with the purpose. So, so what is the, your company's purpose? Like why, why does it exist? What is it established to do? And so, um, you know, from that, you, you know, you, you then work out the, the, the what and the, and the, and then the how. Um, so, f so for us, like, it is really kind of like really focused on, on the... <laughs> no, Cl Chloe yes. was the one who introduced me to the golden circle. Ah, perfect. I, I love this, yeah. I love this philosophy. And, and for us, like, we have a brand pyramid, right? So at the bottom, you look at the, the functional and emotional benefit of the business. And then that, that ladders all the way up to the brand essence, which for us, it's the, it's the power of well. And really, the whole notion of power of well is, is about the, the 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 ability for you to unlock your full potential uh, through investing in wellness. So, so yeah, it, it's um it's, it's an interesting one. Um, 
but yeah, definitely uh, Google the, the Golden Circle, or the, the Golden uh, yeah, Circle. Um, yeah. It's YouTube, uh, Apple, uh, yeah. etc. Fantastic, will do. Um, finally, before we open up to the audience, I would love to just get one word from everyone on what you think the next big trend in well-being and wellness is. Anything that you've seen, because you guys are the experts and you're in this world, that you think is about to happen or perhaps is starting to happen. Um, Jack, have you got anything to share? Uh, this is a hard one. Um, we, we, we work with most of the FMCG brands out there, um, and what we're seeing, particularly for uh, CPG products, so consum uh, consumer um, packaged goods, is that we are seeing the shift from sort of um, sort of a blend between sort of retail, offline retail experience, and online. Um, so for us, that we're seeing, you know, particularly for what we're doing at the moment, is that there's this convergence uh, and blend between. Um, you know, the, the, the high street retailers and combining that with um, experience led retail um, sort of um, experiences and stuff like Experiential, that. Experiential, definitely. Experiential retail. Do you need anything you've spotted? I think it's along that line, but I feel that if you're predominantly thinking you're starting an online brand and looking at what retail delivers to you as a brand and there's a lot in the business of fashion and things like that recently just about looking at these big brands who are offering again the experiences, but I look at what's my marketing spend if I was to try and get to that audience in just uh, on Facebook or through ads or through social, compared to doing a really targeted group in something that's a pop-up or a, a store. And what, how is there a different value to that customer? So I think really understanding if you're online, there is an imp a real importance on people being able to touch and feel things. And how do you give them that experience? Mm. How do you give them that opportunity? Um, so. That, I think, it's it's ever moving. Mm. Um, Not neglecting the physical space as well, even if you're online even only. Even if you're online, yeah, just looking at that, because you never know how big that audience is who can't quite get to online, but they love what your brand represents. Mm. Interesting. Shuri, anything to share? Uh, yeah, I think when it comes to habit change, we're going to need to start grouping people not according to smokers and drinkers and uh, overeaters, etc. We're going to need to start grouping them according to the problem that they're trying to solve with those behaviours. So uh, uh, with the anxiety, the underlying codependency, the people pleasing, the needing of comfort or distraction from physical or emotional, dis different kinds of physical or emotional discomfort, I think we're being short-sighted thinking that, you know, what is now a problem for the most part in habit change was once a solution or is still a solution to something. And so I think we should be grouping people um, that way be it online or in support groups or in terms of who we're marketing our products to in as a self-help category, in the self-help category. I think there are three key factors that are going to really drive growth in the wellness industry over the next 10 years. Um, actually, you could say these are true of any industry, but I think it's convenience, value, and personalization. So convenience is all about ease of access. So Trini alluded to this, you know, how easily can you access the product and, you know, this whole thing of online, offline. But, uh, you know, not that, not that long ago, it was really hard to access wellness products. You'd have to go to great lengths to try and find a wellness store, a natural health store. And now almost every supermarket has a wellness section. So there's this ease of access that is uh, really proliferated. And I think we're only going to see it grow. And the other point is value. So far, you know, wellness was it was perceived as being something that was more reserved for the elite, or you had to pay quite a premium for it. But I think we've had such a plethora, plethora of brands that have emerged at lower price points that you know it's sort of you know there's been a you know anybody can afford it now. It's mm -hmm. not um, only for those with more dis with a higher disposable income. And the third trend is personalization. So my business is all about personalization. Um, a lot of our businesses are about personalization. But when you think of, you know, uh, I remember a time when you know, I was looking for a health bar and you know, there, were, there were not even a handful of choices. And now there are hundreds of options. And this is happening across the industry. And so the more choice there is, you know, the easier it is for people to find the products that are best suited to them. So I think it's the confluence of these three factors that are really going to fuel the growth in the in the wellness industry over the next decade. Fantastic, thank you. I kind of think there are two things that are sort of interrelated. 
One, I think sleep. I think it's extraordinary how little people really are looking at it and understanding it from a from a well-being perspective. Mm -hmm. And I think just this this sort of idea that there are you know very few real foundations that you need to have to be healthy and happy and sleep is a pretty critical one of them that no one really ever considers they just sort of go to sleep and that'll do and i think that's i do think that's something that but there will be a, a big opportunity but also a real change and then just generally bigger than that is is just a reprioritization of our kind of health agenda basically shifting completely away from physical health to mental health and certainly just this understanding that a, a bit like sleep is a critical you know pillar of well-being without mental well-being your physical well-being is absolutely screwed mm. and so those two shifts i think are, are, are pretty big ones yeah absolutely fascinating as someone who runs off about five hours sleep i think you're probably right we all need to change well i'd like to say a massive thank you to our wonderful panel Uh, we have some time now um, for some audience questions, so I'd be delighted if any of you have any questions to ask to our panel. Um, please go ahead. Sure. Thank you. Great question. Delightful talk. Thank you so much. Um, in terms of um, a change, if you were to look back and try to choose something that you would not do these days when promoting your brand, what would that be? Ooh, that's a good question. So things you wouldn't do to promote your brand? Things you would change? In the, in the sort of journey of building a business? Yeah. I, for me, it, like it's a, it would have been hire people earlier. And so I think when you're, when you're very young as a business, you, you, you have this mentality that you've got to bootstrap absolutely everything, do everything yourself, you should be cleaning, you should be doing everything, which is, has a grain of truth to it for sure, but is completely and utterly unsustainable. And you soon learn, we certainly learn that people are really helpful. If you get good people, they're really, really helpful. And so actually invest in people properly, get great people on board with you. Um, and, and that's something I think we got wrong. We, we, for too long, Nick and I just ground it out and tried to build a whole business ourselves, which was probably a bit of a mistake. Anything else anyone would like to share? I wish I had known that it was okay to be difficult earlier on. Because <laughs> I was too nice and polite. And then afterwards people would say, well, you didn't say anything. Mm. And I realized now it was because I didn't want them to think I was a difficult woman to work with. But now I don't mind if they think that. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with being a difficult woman, eh? Amazing. Um, yeah, sure. Um, hello there or to all the panel. I have been watching the Twitter wall and there have been lots of comments coming out from all of our um, fellow guests watching the screenings in Hull, Manchester, Cambridge, Exeter, Glasgow, Norwich, Peterborough and this question from someone um, watching in Nottingham. Sam asks uh, specifically after Trini's speech, how did you go about pinning down what your prospective customer's attitude was? I think it's relevant to a few of you, but mm. that came out in your speech. I think somebody on the panel said that sometimes a customer doesn't know what they want until you present it to them. So, you know, there, there is no stackable personalised makeup. So we will bring something out that it, I just had to think of all the... Like, I've made over probably um, 3,000 women over 20 years. So their voices are kind of in my head. That's my market research. So there's been times along my journey where I've had clever market research people telling me what they think I should do. And it's kind of, I sort of know, I know these women. I, I spend, you know, every morning I do a live and there's sort of 5,000 women on it. And I speak and hear women every single day. And I never, however the business goes, it's so important that I keep that connection with my audience and with the customer. Because then I'll find out, okay, what does she want next? And I'll get a more sense of it. So, you know, I've got, I'm in the first section of what my big plan is, which is not just makeup. So it's like, when do I bring them out? How do I bring them out? The trust of your customer is so important. Do they trust you to extend your range to X, you know? Mm -hmm. So really having the beating heart of your customer is, I think, the most important thing when you're a consumer facing business. Amazing. I don't know if I asked the question, but that's funny. Any more questions? Yeah, Brian. My question kind of well, there's, a, there's a mic coming away. Just, yeah, there you go. 
My question kind of relates to that as an entrepreneur as well. I find it really hard to spend time on social media because I'm busy running my business. But obviously, you've got a really successful brand in doing that. So how do you balance the different time demands of speaking to your customers and then also doing all the other things you need to do to be successful in the business? I'm not, I think this, I don't want to speak for other members of the panel, but it's like every waking moment is about my business to an extent. You know, I'm thinking about as I'm lying in bed, I'm answering emails before I go to the office. Um, you know, I, I balance in my life, my daughter is calling me from Africa, she's helping build a school in Africa, she keeps calling me, and she's 15 on her first trip, so I'm sorry the phone keeps going, but I just have that, you know, I have to fit it into everything. Um, so, you know, before I came out this evening, I was getting my makeup done, I did a live, I chatted. So I just make it a part of the rhythm of my day so I never feel that there is an obligation to it. It's always kind of joyful. You know, weirdly, when I'm feeling a bit flat and I'm thinking I have so many business problems to do, you know, my partner says to me, just go and talk to your ladies. You know, and, and so I'll go and I'll think, oh, I don't have the energy today. And I'll get on there and, you know, I think it's, it's so important just to be so bloody honest, like what you were saying, so honest about how you're feeling, what's going on, and, and people then, we all connect the most to people who feel honest. So I don't make it, it's not a chore, it's an organic part of what I do, and I don't separate them out, actually. And, you know, Lila has been having to be, you know, out of the day with me occasionally. You know, and there is that thing I, I feel the responsibility as a parent with um, how my daughter reacts to that, because I don't, you know, so it's a delicate balance, that, more than anything else, actually. True. where does social fit into your life? I've only been on Instagram for a year, and um, I've, I'm inclined to get obsessed with it, mm -hmm. so I have to have rules in place. So I, I do what I call, you know, a lot of you, if you read about tech, there's a lot about creating frictionless environments, so basically, You've barely even looked at a toaster and it's like arrived at your house. And um, for me, what I try to do is impose friction. So actually what I do is I decide I'm going to do a post at the beginning of the day or whenever the insights have told me that I should. Bear in mind, I have like 4,000 followers, so I'm certainly not an influencer here. <laughs> I'm not even like a micro, micro, micro influencer. <laughs> but I've done pretty well in terms of the engagement that I get from that proportion of people. I, I would trust that most of them have read my book. And uh, what I do is I don't only log out, but I delete the app <laughs> until the rest of my work is done, and then I check. Or else I'm just checking how many people like it. Maybe, no, maybe later on in my career I'll be more secure, but I'm f quite fresh. <laughs> so I'm still looking like, who likes it? Are they verified? What have they written? Do they like me? Who's following me? Like, I, I can become really obsessed with it. Um, and then I try, and then I look at competitors, and I find myself down a hole when I should have just been doing my work. So in the same way that I've done it with Deliveroo and Uber Eats, <laughs> <laughs> I remove my credit cards. I just lock myself out of the equation, and I put as many steps between me. One, essentially, what I teach people to do in everyday life with impulse control, I put as many steps as possible between me wanting to do something and actually being allowed to go through with it. Um, and so in that way, it's just on my to-do list. Like, do a post. Although I don't do live videos yet, I'm, I would like to learn to do them. I don't know how to do those I'm going to show things. you afterwards, because I have to do. be very good at it. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And could okay. you make me over as well? Because <laughs> <laughs> all of these things, I am, I am learning. But I do think, um, for me personally, I don't feel secure enough yet to be living in that world um, all day. I find it scary. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, any more questions? This is the lady here. There's a microphone coming to you. There you go. Not wishing to bring up gender, but I was surprised. This seems to be mostly aimed at women. Is the wellness edition or the wellness movement a woman's thing, or is uh, was the name is the next best thing or the next new thing? I should say to be appealing to men because I know men love your products, Trini. I'm sure there's lots of room for. Um, male involvement, um, but it does seem to be a very female thing. Am I wrong? Oh, uh, I can speak to that. So mine is very much uh, unisex uh, business. The product, even if you look at um, our actual products, they're very gender neutral. I mean, they're 
glass bottles, pastel colors. Lots of men use our products. They buy them for themselves and use them. And it's really busy individuals. So I don't say it's targets you know, busy women. It's busy individuals who are looking for moments of peace and calm to balance their hectic lifestyles. So ours um, is very much gender neutral. It's mm -hmm. for everybody. For, for us as well, um, we have just over half a million customers and a quarter million of them are male. So. Okay. Ours also, actually, I mean, it's interesting because I think things, certain parts of it are very gendered and some aren't. I mean, I, I, I always think it's really interesting that, and this is an open advert, is that we have, we have 20 people in our HQ kind of team, or 19 people in our HQ team. Me and my co-founder are men. We've never, we've never publicly said we are only hiring women, but we just don't get job applicants. When people, men don't apply for jobs with us. I don't, don't know why that is, but it is absolutely yeah. extraordinary. We've got one other guy who, who's in our core team. Um, and so that is very gendered, it seems, for some reason, is that men don't want to work for a yoga business. But like Jack, ours, ours is 40% you know, male, which, is, which surprises a lot of people. Um, and yeah, so I think it, it depends. Yeah, I, I, we have about 50 people at Trinity London, and I would say seven are men. Or maybe nine are men, yeah. If I count some of the retail kill for that yeah. ratio. <laughs> <laughs> But, but proportionally, you know, we, in, in terms of packaging, and I think that when you were saying the, uh, the appeals should change and the, the, the way we compartmentalize audiences should change, I think this is a, one of the biggest things in marketing. So instead of that lovely Olivier saying, what's your age range? It's like, we should be looking at audiences so uh, differently. Mm. And, um, and it's about the emotional connection they have with your brand. Whoever they are, however old they are, the color of their skin, what religion they follow, male, female, gender neutral, whatever it is, you know. Do you connect with them emotionally? Mm. Fantastic. Any more questions? Lady over here. There's a mic coming to you. She's here. Lady in the green top. Hi. Uh, thank you. Um, I have two questions, very quick questions. One was for Max um, about, he said, now I've probably got the timeline wrong, but about, the, it sounded like you got your franchise going about six months after your business. How exactly did you do that? Did you get external consultants to come in and help you? or Because there's a lot with the legal and the contracts. How did that work out? Like a lot of things as it's transpired, uh, we did it in a kind of do-it-yourself way. I kind of wrote the first franchise agreement, which was interesting. It was kind of like this. It was essentially to our first... I mean, we were really honest with our first franchisee. We, had, we basically had loads of interest right from the start of people saying... Because we had lots of press, we were in Vogue very early on, Daily Mail very early on, lots of big international publications very early on. We literally had thousands of people apply for a franchise. And we were, we were saying, let's do this three, four years down the line. Or no, we were saying probably let's do it two years down the line once we'd learned. But people were really, really pushy to knocking on our doors and we really want to do this. And we had to hold our hands up and say, we don't know anything about our business yet. The point of buying into a franchise is you're buying into the expertise of the brand that you're buying into. We didn't know anything, but we were really honest with the people. We were like, we don't really know anything yet, but what I can promise you is this pod and I can tell you what I do know, which could probably fit on one post-it pad or one post-it slip. Um, and, and that was it. And, and we did, you know, like genuinely, I wrote the first draft of a franchise agreement because it was what made sense to me. We did nothing in our whole business based on, you know, something in a box. It was all very much like what makes sense for us, what makes sense for our franchisees. Then we eventually got a lawyer to redraft it so that it actually had some legal merit. Um, but it, it was genuinely a very organic process and the model was put together genuinely and it's such an easy thing to kind of a trite thing to say but genuinely with a how does this benefit the franchisee and how does it benefit us we need to make sure this is mutually beneficial and that's what we did great thank you and can i ask one other very quick question this is for jack um you mentioned that you started off your business in terms of to give practitioners more uh, percentage could you share an approximation of what they get now? Yeah, they get 75% oh, of wow. the okay. screen. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. Respect. Uh, yes, ladies, eagerly had some good hands there. Hi there. Thanks, um, everyone, this evening. Um, I think one of the first questions was about hiring people. Um, we're starting to look at that at the moment. I've had a few false starts. I wonder if anyone could give any tips about 
where to find good people, how to know good people, how to keep good people? Yeah, that's a Thanks. good question. Um, my first two hires were Chloe, who's sitting here, and, um, and Federica, and they came in as interns. And I just, it was me sitting in my desk in my house. Um, so it was the very beginning of the idea, so they were there from the very start. And where we're at now is a really interesting place because there's quite a young team, 75% of them are under the age of 30. And I have to weigh out passion and lack of knowledge versus knowledge, but not so much you know, knowledge externally, but not knowledge of our business or, or necessarily the passion. So to me, if somebody is naturally smart, you kind of tell straight away if somebody has that. Do they feel a passionate person? It depends what role you have. For the accountant, maybe you don't need the passion. But you know, if somebody is front facing, sorry, accountant, somebody is front facing, you need them to really embody what that business is and, and then see where their skills lie. I love the fact that we give opportunity to girls out of school and, and maybe just having had a first job. And, you know, I enjoy nothing more in the interview to say, you know, there's an opportunity here that twice a year your salary might go up and, and you might get much further afield and learn a lot more than if you were very steady. You know, but there are different people who want to go to startups. And, you know, we're at a stage now where we need people with more experience. So those, those people that I've brought in early now need to learn from really deep wells. You know, and I'm not a marketeer by, by experience, I am by nature. But you know, like Chloe, to learn more, to have somebody that she, you know, that, that, that you, put, you put processes in place. I hate processes. <laughs> you know, I want to just be like we were in our little tiny house. We recently moved office. We had a little tiny house. And there were like 19 people literally sitting on top of each other. I would have my meetings in the loo and two people had a desk on the staircase. I mean, it was really intimate, but we got to know each other incredibly well. And there's something any startup will say to you that those first, you know, those first, that first year or so when you're in that and you know each other well and you've got your back, you kind of want to keep that as long as you can in a business because that's when you see really good work ethic in businesses, it comes from that. And so I believe that comes from passion in people. Mm. Um, and to me, that's the most important thing when I interview okay. someone. Amazing. Thank you so much, everyone. Unfortunately, we've run out of time, but if you have any more questions, hopefully our speakers will be around afterwards and you can go up to them and ask them. I've just got a couple of housekeeping things before we finish. There are some feedback forms on your seats. We would be very, very appreciative if you could fill them in. That helps us put on more events. Um, and there's a prize draw as well with some wonderful products uh, from the speakers in that. And also applications for the next intake of Innovating for Growth Scale Up open soon. Um, that is open to any small business with a turnover of a minimum of 100K. And uh, you can win £10,000 of bespoke training and growth-focused um, support on that. Thank you so much.